Texas A&M University Commerce undergraduates are currently conducting oral histories with veterans as part of the East Texas War and Memory Project. The students developed the idea for the project and with the guidance of faculty, have revitalized the school's oral history program. Created to celebrate and honor the sacrifices of men and women who served in the United States Armed Forces, the project is a collaborative initiative with the university's Honors College, the James G. Library, the Department of History, the Department of Literature and Languages, and the Office of Institutional Advancement. The project began taking shape two years ago when Digital Collections librarian Adam Northam and Andrea Weddle, head of Special Collections, worked with Dr. Eric Groover, Director of Honors Advising for the University's Honors College, to incorporate primary sources into his history courses. Students were tasked with writing contextualized summaries of previous oral histories collected by the university. Six of those students expressed the desire to conduct the interviews themselves, and the East Texas War and Memory Project was launched. At just a year old, the project is now comprised of 18 interns, with 120 interviews, a lecture series at the university, appearances at several conferences, and a partnership with the Air Force Association Chapter 416. Part of oral history includes obtaining information from different perspectives. Gathering the perceptions from persons who observed the wars are just as important as the accounts from the veterans themselves. For this, interns look to speak with anybody who had a life experience with war. The wife or children of a veteran will sometimes sit in the interviews and talk from their perspective. Some veterans prefer to meet at the university library but usually crews of two interns travel to the individual's house to get their story. From as far as San Antonio and San Angelo, veterans from all over East Texas have contacted the students of the project. As the project gets more publicity, more veterans want to get involved, developing the endeavor into an entity that captures the stories of veterans from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam with the desire to collect stories from other conflicts. Lieutenant Colonel Eldon Turner became part of the ROTC at then New Mexico A&M and graduated in May 1951 with a degree in electrical engineering. Commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Air Force, Turner applied for pilot school and received his wings on September 13, 1952. In 1954, he joined the Strategic Air Command at Forbes Air Force Base in Topeka, Kansas. During his 28 years of service, Lieutenant Colonel Turner flew RB-29s, RB-47s, C-54s, C-47s, C-123s, and T-39s, which was his favorite plane. We had the physics department had gotten a bunch of white rats. We had them in compartments. We had the power set up. We were all ready to go. We were going to release this gas in the airplane and see if it affected the trap rats. And of course, we were in there too. And we knew we were releasing it. <clears throat> so the C-124 showed up. They had no idea what they were going to do. Except they were there to fly us as we flew. We had this mission. So we took the mission, flew it around, and on the signal, everybody had their oxygen mask on and their ma gas mask, and, and we had the rats strategically placed in the aircraft. We released the gas. Nothing happened, of course. You better hope it don't. So we came back, tested the rats. No, everybody was tested, all the people that went. Nobody had any radiation. We flew, we did it two more times. We decided this was not, that even if the gas was released in the aircraft, it was not a hazard. Marlon Baker grew up in California with his mother and two brothers. His father died working in the mines in the Oakland area and both brothers served in the military during the Second World War. Following high school, Baker attended a local missionary school in hope of ministering in the Far East, but the Korean War delayed that goal. In the midst of fighting, 
Baker and another soldier stepped on a landmine, propelling them backwards in the air. Marlin sustained injuries from shrapnel and barbed wire to his head, arms, and legs, and medical staff transported him to Osaka Hospital in Japan. Um, the day that I was, uh, the day before I was wounded, I was out on what we call an outpost. There's three fo uh, foxholes out there, uh, fighting positions. But the purpose of a of a outpost is that if the enemy should attack, uh, which would probably happen at nighttime. Um, they were able to inform the lines to, so that they will get little loss, less loft, loss of life. But um, I was out there, and the first shift in the morning, there were just two of us out there then, and um, our phone line was disconnected. So uh, I got out of my trench, out of my fighting position, and went over to the other one that was empty, to see if their phone worked, and it did, and I contacted for a relief because they were an hour late in relieving us. And uh, then um, they relieved us with two other fellows, and before I got back to my lines, I heard some hand grenades go off, and we went back, and both my buddies were dead. Uh, there was one lone soldier between, behind one lone tree. We could see his knee print and his hand print and how he lobbed the hand grenades into the foxholes. Now, if I had stayed in the foxhole, it could have been me. But because I got out of the fog, so it was foggy and the, the enemy couldn't see us, but we didn't have any idea there was one lone communist soldier out there. But I, I just was so grateful that God spared my life, making me get out of the hole, which was a thing not to do, but I did it, and it saved my life. And the next day was the day that I was wounded, and because um, of the, what happened that day, um, the next day, I was out in front of the lines, right down in the valley, real close to the enemy lines, and why they never shot at us, I don't know, but they didn't. And I was protecting the men that was putting up the barbed wire entanglement. And um, uh, then I, I was in charge of six men out there, six of us, and going back to my own position after I checked on the left and the right, um, I thought that I was coming into a landmine field, but what I didn't know, I had already walked through the landmine field, and I stepped on a landmine anyway, and it blew my friend and I about many yards apart. And I was not knocked out. I remember everything that happened. I remember flying through the air, landing on my face, and I prayed for my buddy, but he was already dead. And by the way, he was the only man in my division that was killed on that day. In the whole 40th division, just one man died, and it was the man that stepped on, that was with the landmine that we stepped on.